Hi everyone, welcome to 2021, first YouTube live. Thanks for joining me for Letters from Esther Live, the monthly workshop series that helps you reflect, act, and develop greater confidence and relational intelligence in all your relationships. This series happens monthly on YouTube and Facebook Live. And if you want more letters from Esther, just go directly to estherperel.com slash blog. And I invite you to join us every month here on YouTube or Facebook to discuss the newsletter live. So we read it, we think about it, we talk about it, we argue with it, we ask questions, we interact with the content um, and with the new ideas that I hope will give you that confidence in your relationships. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to take a notebook dedicated to the workshops and so you can keep notes time after time of anything else in your life that helps you develop relational intelligence. If not pen and paper, uh, you know, find the way that you like to take your notes and think of someone that you think should really be here with you now, wherever they are in the world. Just let them know to join us um, for this um, live session. And throughout the session, you're going to submit your questions in the live chat. You can make comments um, under the recording once the videos are archived. So just stay engaged with us. Talk to me. I need to hear you. I need to read you. I need to know what's on your mind. And if you like what you learned today, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You find the buttons for that below the video. And if you want a copy of the slides that I'm going to be showing, same thing, find the link in the description below so that you can stay with the questions, share them with friends or family, and then continue to have the most important conversations that you need to have. So today, we're going to look back at this challenging year, and we're going to use what we've learned from the experience to help us in the year ahead. Here's my idea for this workshop. We look back at the past year. Yes, it's been a year. <laughs> the toll that it has taken on our sense of connection, our spontaneity, our levels of energy, what I call eroticism. And we're going to explore how the power of fantasy and imagination can help us pull us out of the slump. It's what I have had to do. It's what I try to do almost on a daily basis. And I thought I can't be alone. I'll share with you what is on my mind, and we're going to create a resource pool together of the best things that we have come up with and just pass them on to the next person and see you know, what can help us. I want to explain exactly what I mean when I use the word eroticism or when I use the word fantasy in this context. It's my playfulness with the vocabulary. You know, I say eroticism, but I'm not just talking about sex per se. That's a part of it but that's really not what it's all about. I define eroticism as those qualities of vitality, of curiosity, of spontaneity that make us feel alive. I don't have to tell you, you can have sex that is not erotic and that is completely flat and lifeless and without energy and without curiosity and without mystery. And you can have a sexuality that is infused with these things. It's the same in life. It's the quality of the experience that I'm talking about, not the act and the actions per se. What am I referring to? For me, those things that make me feel alive usually and that I'm yearning for at this moment is that unexpected yet welcome touch on a great first date. It's the weekend away from a partner because absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's the hug with grandma after a few weeks apart. It's running into a dear friend and spontaneously just extending it into a drink. It's traveling to a new place and experiencing it unfold before my eyes. It's a laugh that I share with a stranger in line. It's the waiter's recommendation that I'm going to take because I have no clue of what I want to eat today. It's merging with a crowd in a live concert while I'm dancing to my favorite band. It's talking with someone on the subway just because we both noticed something. And it's grabbing a coffee with a colleague near the office. It's all those things and many more that I wrote down for myself, but I thought these are daily activities that are generally bringing juice in our lives and that are for many, many of us at this moment really absent. This kind of eroticism went into lockdown with us nearly a year ago 
when life's delectable little mysteries were suddenly replaced by the great unknown. In my mind, in an effort to flatten the curve, we have flattened ourselves and we are yearning to regain some energy. So aside from all the obvious concerns at this moment, health, economy, work, school, many of us are concerned with this flatness that we feel. And here is a series of words that are the opposite of eroticism. So you'll get a sense, right? When we don't have energy or when we do have energy, when we experience connection or when we don't, when we experience spontaneity, when we experience chance, chance encounters, happenstance, fun, playfulness, surprise, all of this is what I call the erotic. And the erotic has taken a beating. So many of us are complaining about the stresses that come with living with prolonged uncertainty, combined with the loss of things that make us feel alive. I mean, every session that I almost have with patients at this moment starts with, how are you doing? It's dark, it's cold, it's long. When is this ending? I don't know where this is going. I, have, I just don't feel that drive, you know? So I think this is worldwide. Um, and I think that this is normal. This is not your personal problem. But there may be collective experiences with collective solutions here. I miss the spontaneous movement in my office when a shift in the body language suddenly shifts the conversation, suddenly kind of shifts the entire session. That kind of spark I miss. And on the other side lies that flatness. Virtual sessions, all great but it also makes me feel quite often disembodied. You too, with kind of a disembodied versions of yourselves. And at the same time, we all have to come up and have done so, you know, with old and new coping skills that help us stay afloat, you know, things that connect us to our imagination. My, my nephews had sent me pictures of their children and nieces and it, these little kids had built boxes and these boxes had become huts. And from these huts that they were spying on the people that were gonna come to their territory and with nothing through their imagination, an entire universe was created. The boxes went on books, the books became rocks, the rocks were in the river. This is something that children do so naturally and something about that we need to reconnect with as adults. But other kinds of, act, of, uh, of um, things that have kept us alive have had to do with political and social activism, with being engaged around the elections, with volunteering, with making sure that our neighbors get their food, with picking up painting again, or tennis again, or restringing the guitar finally and starting to take some lessons online or exploring makeup like an art. You know, since you can't go out, you may just as well play with the makeup. You know, doing things with our hands has been really essential. In the beginning of the pandemic, everybody in their neighbor was making bread, you know, sourdough bread. But then I thought it's bread, but it's painting, but it's makeup. The point is when you do something with your hands, you make something happen. You create something out of nothing. And creating something, bringing something into the world, by definition is an antidote to flatness and to deadness, to the nothingness. It's so important. It's not just about exercising and staying active. It's really about creating something. And there's so many things we can, we can create, you know, um, make something happen. I think it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful image um, of fantasy to work with. Um, and a great one for me, has been forming a pod. I think that, you know, this is one of my favorite words of the, of the pandemic is finding a way to create a group that can safely connect together, that can spend time together. And then maybe after a week, 10 days or so can even hug each other because we are so touch deprived, so touch hungry. So that's been for me, one of the things that I've really wanted to do. I also started to play tennis again. I figured out that, you know, you, you can play and maintain distance. If amazing, amazing. It's like 10 years I've been wanting to get back to it. I finally, you know, am holding the racket in my hand. And when I'm not holding the racket in my hand, I'm about to play the guitar again, you know, because 
that too, it's like, not I'm not creating something new. I'm bringing back something that I had lost, that I have missed for so long, and for which I had a hundred excuses never to really get back to. I kept saying, I want to, I want to, but nothing really was happening. And there's something about this time that actually kind of rearranges those priorities. And um, I would say that one of the greatest coping skills that we've had to cultivate in this past year is this playing with our imagination, this sense of how our mind can take us outside of reality, outside of the limitations that we are currently living in. Really, I've said it over and over again, freedom in confinement comes from our imagination. I learn it every time with my yoga teacher, when you hold yourself and then you have to start to look from underneath, you know, you can actually see the top, it's the confinement, but the freedom comes from imagining that I can actually come from under it. The mind will take us to places where we may not necessarily be able to go, but the very act of thinking about it, of imagining it, of anticipating it is crucial. So I would say that where eroticism has suffered, fantasy has thrived. If we can really activate it. You know, I've asked you on social media with a couple of prompts to answer this question. One thing this year that you want to let go of. And what's one thing that you would like to develop? I asked everybody to write it. I think the act of writing it's, this itself is important as well. Prompts about imagination, right? Something that I want to let go of, that I want to surrender, that I want to release, and something that I want to develop further, that I, that I want to harness, that I want to maintain. These prompts about imagination are connected with other questions, right? Just I'm going to add them. What do you imagine that 2021 will be like? Where does your imagination take you? What would you love to see for yourself and for your relationships in 2021? And what are some of the aspects of 2020 that you would like to leave to make room for the new stuff to actually come in? And there were so many answers, but it was very quick. Everybody seemed to really know immediately. I want to release insecurity. I want to develop a deeper sense of self-love. I want to release my grief, and I want to develop the skills to go after what I want. I want to release my chronic resentment, my aggression, my anger, my negative thoughts, my self-criticism, and I want to develop self-compassion. I want to release the relationships that don't serve me particularly at this moment, especially with family members, and I want to develop relationships that do serve me. It's on IG, just go and see. But it, I, it's so inspiring for me to see how clear a good question structures our imagination and instantly the answers just come out, you know? And I really like the fact that you pointed out the importance of writing these things down because it connects us emotionally with what we want for ourselves. So let's take a step back. Now that we've defined eroticism, right? Aliveness, curiosity, vitality, imagination, playfulness, spontaneity. I want you all to write down for yourself a few erotic experiences that you miss at this moment. For me, it would be from going to restaurants to going to live concerts instantly. But write down three erotic experiences that you have been missing a lot lately. Think of those little moments of happenstance that knock you from your routine and go ahead, fill up the chat box. Just start answering. You know, I've done the exercise myself, so I'm just going to muse with you as to some of the things that I was listing. You know, I miss dinner parties. Before March 2020, I attended or hosted dinner parties almost weekly. Why? I love the chance encounters that a great dinner party brings. While I like to mix the flavors of a dish, I especially delight in the concoction of the people around the table. You never know who you're going to sit next to. I love that. Other people may dread that, but for me, that's a big one. It's like, whoa, which book am I going to read tonight? It's like, which person am I going to sit next to? You never know who you're going to sit next to. What great questions will be asked? What delicious meal will be served? and how long the evening will last. And by the way, 
we always remember the conversation way more than the food. And from there, my latest discoveries in the last few months was came from throwing rocks into a frozen lake. I mean, you know, you couldn't have made a bigger switch from totally social urban to calm, ice cold lakes and the sound of the rock that touches that lake. I went one morning and actually I was really surprised that I even stopped, that I paid attention and that I enjoyed it, that I spent like quite a long time there, throwing the rock, seeing the curves that it made, you know, the sound, seeing, you know, if the ice was going to break. I stayed focused on something that was very different and very new to me. It's not like I've never thrown a rock on ice, but it had a very different quality. You know, I could never, um, I, I could never be sure how each one would sound when it cracked the surface and what happened to the bubbles underneath the ice. What happened? You know, what universe alive lives there? You know, sometimes I would video record it and send it to friends wishing that they were standing next to me. So I connected the contemplative with the social, the, the personal with the group, with the friends, you know. Um, I think about how we'd run through the snow laughing if they were next to me, how we would make a hot meal together and sit by the fire. That's the fantasy. That's the imagination. I would imagine what it would be to hug them and what life will be like on the other side of the pandemic. And what will we do first? And where will we go? And what will be the first trip? And so... I also had something to say to them because sometimes you kind of say, if nothing's happening in my life, I don't literally have much to tell. But once I'm not busy telling, but I'm busy imagining us in a series of activities together, that's a completely different note, you know? So let me see, have you written to me erotic experiences you've been missing lately, dancing with others, concerts, affection, movies, volunteering, salsa dancing, food with friends, a crowded, noisy restaurant, weddings, yes, coffee with my colleagues, giving friends hugs, brunches with my friends, touching a stranger for the first time, blowing bubbles with my goddaughter, traveling, tango, not having to cross the street when I see someone coming. Yeah, that one is a major one, right? Not seeing every spontaneous encounter as a potential spontaneous contamination. So important. So we live with that longing. You know, and when you stay put for a minute and you just start, you know, it just becomes a very, very sad, sometimes lonely moment. All these experiences that make us feel alive that are currently not available, you know. But this is where the imagination comes in, right? When we imagine being with our friends and we remember trips we took and it becomes really palpable as if we were right there. Our imagination is filling the gaps that reality imposes on us. When we can bring back our father who died and we talk to him or to mom or granda, grandpa, and we just talk to them, we bring them back through our imagination as if they were right there. We hear them. We see them. Our imagination connects absence with presence, life with death young with old. Our imagination allows us to see the parts of our body that are no longer there, the hair that has fallen, the breasts that have been confiscated. It's an amazing way to close the gap. It allows us to project ourselves into situation. When I'm thinking about the next trip, I can see myself there. I have this anticipatory experience. We are the only people who can literally create an alternate reality just with our mind, you know, either by projecting forward in anticipation, either by going backwards through our memory. And there are nuanced differences between imagination and memory and fantasy, but they do live side by side and they all help us pull through these challenging times. You know, when I look up antonyms for imagination, I get words like fecklessness, meekness, inactivity, indolence, indifference, passivity, you get the gist. I mean, this is one world, this is the other one. You know, think about it. That means that when we don't engage in the power of our imagination, 
we become feckless, meek, indolent, passive. Kind of how I've been feeling on and off lately. How about you? You know, I can't imagine that this is just me. So exercise number two, write down a few of the fantasies of connection and regeneration that have helped you accommodate your erotic losses this past year. These should be fantasies that energize you. And feel free to fill up the chat box once again. You know, it may be fantasies of going to your favorite boutique, favorite restaurant, favorite barista, you know, with friends, traveling to somewhere tropical, a winter wonderland trip. Maybe you fantasized about moving in with your boyfriend. Maybe you fantasize about finally getting a divorce after months of living on top of each other with both of you, you know, having to work from home. Maybe you fantasized about talking to grandma on a road trip through where she grew up, something that you've never done and have been talking about for years. But the pandemic came and it all went on standstill. So tell me, how has the power of your imagination worked for you? Let me get a sense. You know, I'm going to wait a minute because you're going to be writing these things to me. Um, and all of you, read it when I read it to you as well, because these are really social collective experiences in this moment. It's really important that we not think, what's wrong with me? Why can I not? Looks like everybody else and all of that stuff, right? So. Where has your imagination filled the gaps for you lately? And I'm talking about the positive imagination, the one that has brought energy and aliveness and radiance and joy into your life, okay? You know, because I'm also going to be asking about the reverse, right? How the power of our imagination has extended our fears. I mean, I have the propensity sometimes to go quite catastrophic in my thinking, and I have not been spared from that. I just gave you the other side, too, because I, I prefer to talk about this side, but it's I've had both, and I can't imagine that I'm alone again, you know. So, you know, when our imagination goes on overdrive, you know, in the direction of the bad stuff, you know, uh, where we start to really see, you know, dark big, big black clouds, you know? So, and that's, and we can be very, very creative in thinking about scary things, you know? Uh, hypothesizing how bad it will be, how the economy will never recover, how, you know, uh, apocalyptic outcomes of all sorts, you know? Um, how we're gonna be dead in God knows how many weeks, how New York City will never come back, my beloved place, how the market, the housing market will never recover, you know, all of that stuff, you know, how we will never get another job, you know, how they will not reopen the schools and, and how, you know, we won't be able to keep the job if they don't reopen the schools. I mean, it's endless, right? How we won't be able to see the grandparents, you know, and if we visit them, you know, and if we don't visit them, then they may die of loneliness. So anyway, let me hear a few things. Um, going camping, yes. Swimming in the ocean, yes. Spending time with my 96-year-old aunt. Yes. Uh, making travel plans. Great. Dancing with a man. Hugging people for the first time. Moving to a different country. Getting married and having a wedding. Traveling to my favorite city. A wedding celebration. A party. Making Christmas cookies with my nieces. Being at an outdoor music festival sharing a bed with someone new, coffee and pastries with friends on a Sunday morning. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, to me, what stands out is that these are all things that we, we, it's not that we took them for granted, but they have become really precious. You know, when we do them, it's not a given. It takes thinking, organizing, planning, arranging. This is why every single one of these to me, resonates very differently than the way that they have done that they have done all along. And we're going to do one other one. You know, what have you been most uncertain about? Write it down for yourself. Tell it in the chat box. Just a few, you know, of your thoughts. What have you been most uncertain about? 
Because what we will look at is how much are the things that you miss, the things that you've done, the things that you worried you won't be able to do again, or how much are the things that you've lost fed by the uncertainty and fed by the inability to engage with your imagination or to actually realize them. You will see, if you look at your answers, they usually are interrelated. This reconnects with that. It's not like it's three separate categories. You know? I don't regret the time I spent fantasizing about what could go wrong because I think it kept me safe. But I do feel myself turning a corner now, you know? I'm not out of the woods. I've not had the vaccine. Um, but something says to me that, you know, um, this is going to be a different period. And then comes a day and I say, nothing has changed. It's going to be a whole other year of this. So I go back and forth. I go back and forth all the time, you know. But I do allow myself to fantasize about what can go right this year. And I'm kind of trying to turn my imagination into overdrive, you know, for good. Overdrive for good. You know, an overactive imagination for good and often inspired by looking at the children in my life. Yeah, those, you know, uh, that I envy the free range imagination of these kids. And I want a little bit of that back for myself. You know, they know the trick. Freedom in confinement comes from our imagination. They can't leave, but they create a whole universe with boxes and books and they're somewhere else. Ah, I want to be able to do that as well. So even while we continue to navigate the disconnect from our erotic lives, we can, through fantasy and imagination, stay connected to our aliveness. What would you like to imagine? You know, what would you like to imagine? Um, let me read to you a few things, you know, and see which one of these you want to take home with you. That will be your homework. Three things you've lost, three things you've gained in the last year. What did your imagination or what did you imagine when you were in your darkest place? What did you survive? What are three challenges that you have mastered? I love that one. What have been the consequences, good and bad, of mastering these challenges? What was the kindest thing that someone has done for you? What was the kindest thing that you've done for someone else? What were some of your contributions to your community? What was helpful to you? And think about the year ahead. You know, same thing again. One thing you want to release and one thing that you want to develop. What are you excited about? Or what are you afraid of? What would you like to make this year? Not money-wise. What would you like to make? What do you need to do now in order to make that happen? The reason I want you to take these questions, I'll pick one or two of them, you know, don't have to do the whole thing. It's the one, it, it's the, the one that speaks the most to you. Is because I want you to revisit them, your answers, every few months or every few weeks, or every few days, as you choose, and record your progress. Keep this as a tracking device. It really changes the way we know our, ourselves. The kind of detailed attention to the way we answer these questions makes all the difference in the way we do it, in the way we realize what needs to change to do more or to better or to do it differently, in the ways that we know what are the resources we need to go pull from, just pick it. Take a picture of these if you want. Go get the slides, actually. Why am I saying take a picture? Go get the slides. Press on the button and, uh, and pick the ones that will become your frame, your frame for maintaining eroticism and imagination and fantasy to get you out of the winter slump. All right, now start talking to me. You've sent us many questions and I'm sure you will have even more so as we talk together here. So 
Let me take a few of those. And maybe I'll read a few at the same time so we can... Um, how to plan for the future, money, being able to be self-sufficient. I will be able to recover my sexuality before it's too late. How friendships will change. Will I ever be able to rebound from the effects of traumatic loss and experience joy again? So these are the things I'm unsure about. Yes, yes, yes. If you go on IG or if you go on Facebook, when you ask some of these questions, we got hundreds of answers of these things. It's really really powerful sometimes i read them because it makes me feel better it's like i realize oh this is this is what's going on you know and i'm part of i'm part of this um it, it's i'm not alone i can't even tell you how important that is so it's this what are we uncertain about at this point and and what kind of stress does that kind of uncertainty produce in us and therefore how our imagination is one of the most powerful distressors. Okay, give me your questions. How do you deal with the rut and running out of topics to talk about with your partner? I'll tell you a few things that I think are interesting. Let me read the other ones first. How does shame block our erotic side? What can I do when my partner is refusing to try new things, not sexual things? Can you talk to us about singlehood too? How can we bring eroticism into it? All right, I'm going to go. There's a few things here of with partner and without partner. So I think that one of the things that has been really useful to um, create energy with the partner, to find things to talk about, is to actually do two things. A, have experiences away from your partner. Book clubs you attend, movie clubs you attend, hikes you take, ski trips, whatever you can do that is safe around you, snowshoeing, walking in nature, you know, being on a Zoom call with people, and then bringing that stuff into the relationship so that you bring things from outside, things that of the aliveness into the conversation, or you participate together in some of these activities so that you actually have something to talk about outside of the two of you. You read out loud to each other is a great thing. There, some people don't like it. Some people love it. There's something very, very intimate and, and kind of, you know, it's one of the great pleasures of kids is to be read out loud to. That's another one. Um, don't just watch movies together, actually. Watch things that demand discussion about it, conversation, so that you engage with each other over something rather than just marriage incorporated, basically, or relationship incorporated, you know, ink the to-do stuff. Um, on the same end, um, what can you do in terms of when you are single? So I think people are meeting, you know, it's the, the people meet, people date, people connect with friends, people may be single without feeling alone, but it is about staying in a joyful relationship with others where you are not just constantly thinking about how am I going to meet somebody, who am I going to meet, you know, how am I going to date, but basically where you just feel like I'm feeling good and at some point life will introduce me to somebody, either because I still go to the supermarket and I meet someone, either because I'm going on an app and the apps are thriving, so people are meeting, but you are less inclined to meet when you feel flat, because you feel like you have nothing to say, nothing to show for, you know, and not particularly curious about anybody else. So do the things that maintain the energy inside of you so that when then something appears or someone appears in front of you, you have the energy to respond and to initiate something and to make something go. I think that that's the most important thing. It's not that people don't see people, that there's not somebody that is walking in front of you. That is not a line somewhere, that there is a, you know, there's not a post office. Basic stuff that is not just about being on an app. But if you are like this, then you don't open your eyes and you don't see what's in the world. So what you want is to stay energized so that you can make the kinds of connection. How does the shame block our erotic side? Oh, man, it's the... Up, it, it, of, are you asking how it blocks it or why it blocks it or how to unlock it? But... The most important thing of shame is that it's about not being seen. When you feel ashamed, you hide. You don't want to be seen and you don't want to see. You close the eyes and you say, what's wrong with me? You know, shame <coughs> totally um, 
negates the whole person. The erotic is about that playfulness and that unselfconsciousness and that sense of freedom and that sense of entitlement that says you deserve, you're allowed to, you have the permission to feel good, to feel playful, to feel beautiful, to be desired, to desire. Shame shuts all of that down. So that, I don't know if the question is about how do we undo shame? How do we become more kind to ourselves and take the harshness of shame away? Or simply what is the dynamic between shame and feeling alive and erotic? You know, shame is really on the other side of that. What can I do when my partner is refusing to try new things non-sexual? Um, you may, you know, uh, so there's three things. A is you say, we really need this. This is vital for us. This is not just about, you know, and if you don't have it in you, I do at this moment. So you may not want to initiate, but at least don't say no, you know, or you arrange, we're going to do a week, you know, my, I say things, you say yes, you say things, I say yes. So and we have no choice but to say yes to the other person because we need it. The relationship needs it. If we don't do this, we are going to kind of wither away and dry up on the vine. So that's one of the conversations. The other is if you really have a person who doesn't want to engage for whatever the multitudes of reasons, legitimate and less so, go and find it somewhere else. Go and with your friends, go with your family, go with the, the, your colleagues and stay engaged so that you don't have a feeling that because the other person is on a diet, you can't eat. Okay. Um, any other questions? Ah, a whole other stack. How to deal with having a partner who's not open to exploring fantasy? I feel alone in it. How do I not get stuck in a pandemic anxiety with negative fantasies? I mean, in a long distance relationship, how can I keep eroticism alive? Many of us are grieving for the things big and small. How do we let eroticism in? Can over-reliance of fantasy sometimes reduce connection? Okay, look, the big thing about all of these questions is, you know, stuff you do. Um, you know, I heard a story in, in uh, the, of a, a colleague of mine of a couple that basically, you know, want, was meant to go and celebrate their anniversary and their whole thing. And uh, basically, you know, they arranged the whole house. They couldn't go outside. The beach is outside, but they're in lockdown. So they made a little living room. They made a little beach in the living room. They, they turned their flat into an, an Airbnb, a tiny little place, you know, Airbnb. They left with the car, they drove to the airport and they came back home, you know, pretending that they had traveled somewhere and were going to an Airbnb. I thought that was an incredible production value. Not everybody has that in them, but they got the idea, you know, and it was fun. And it was, and, and instead of being all upset about the fact that the trip got canceled and they had to pay for the Airbnb and all of that stuff, they, they turned it around and they became complicit with the harsh reality of the moment. How do you bring the erotic in? You, you, you make it, the main thing is you need buy-in. You need a partner, a roommate, a sibling, whoever you're living with that says, we need this. This is vital at this moment. This is not just little luxuries. You know, it helps going to work. It helps taking care of the people we need to take care of. It helps staying hopeful. It helps with stress and hence it helps with staying healthy. You know, it's the mental health that is going to stay strong in case any other stuff happens to us. So how do you let the erotic in? It's through the senses. Most importantly, it's through the senses. It's visual, it's auditory, it's music. Let's listen and listen to a piece of music together, you know, and just make a space. And all we're going to do is listen to music or dance together or cook together, but not because we need to feed ourselves, but because we're trying to create something. What's a dish you've always wanted to make? Let's make that one. You know, what's the dish you would like me to make? I'm going to, you know, little pleasures. The word pleasure, I haven't uttered that yet, but it is really that, you know, the pleasures of life, you know. Same with the makeup. You can't go out, but you can, you know, pretend to be all kinds of different things. That's all, you know, in the erotic. But you need the buy-in. And the buy-in is to say, this is as important as water at this moment. You know, you can't stay alive without fresh water, but you can't stay alive psychologically alive, sensorially alive without all of that. You can do breathing, you can do mindfulness. 
I think that those things are more often talked about more often. So I want to make sure that I bring in a different sense of, of attention, attention to those pleasures of life, those mysteries of life, you know, the stuff that you can't plan for, the stuff that is not about calming down and staying put, but actually playing with the, with the surprise, you know. So it's that. It's about suddenly changing. It's about setting up the room differently when your partner comes down or your roommate comes down or your friend comes to visit. It's creativity. It's really playfulness and creativity. It's doing what these kids were doing, stacking up books that were actually rocks that then made it look like they were in the river. That is really what I would like you to engage with. You know, we're grieving for big and small. How do we let eroticism in? You have the permission to experience pleasure and joy and celebrations in the midst of pain. Life has always lived side by side with loss and with death and with grief. So don't feel like you're not allowed to. And whatever it is, if it's somebody massaging your foot <laughs> that, you, that can safely touch you, or if it's about taking a walk in the, in the freezing cold, or if it's about letting the hot wind blow over your face, you can allow the erotic. When you say, how can we let it in? It's about the permission more than anything. It hasn't disappeared. It's right there, but it needs the permission. It's about eating without tasting anything of the food you put, just put in your belly or actually taking the moment to savor it and to say, hmm, ha, that piece of chocolate, you know, I'm Belgian. That piece of chocolate, it really, it, 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 I needed just that right now, you know, mm, so good. And that you have the permission to say that at the same time as you are mourning whatever the losses that have occurred in your life. Um, can over-reliance on fantasy sometimes reduce connection? You, this is talk about sexual fantasy, right? Yeah, in fact, then uh, sometimes yes, sometimes yes. You know, there is a sense that um, sometimes people have that this is in the sexual realm, that you'd get turned on by something so precise, so not in this moment, so not about who we are in real life, that at times I wonder, you know, can it just be us without it having to be this party, this play, this threesome, this role play? You know, on occasion, I would like to just play myself, you know, at this stage, with this age, with this body, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so sometimes that is the case that that people need a fantasy that creates just enough emotional separateness so that they can engage sexually with their partner. This is a conversation. If you have somebody on the other side who says, this is what I like, or this is how it has to be, or the other stuff is boring, or you're boring, you're not having a good sexual conversation. You want a sexual conversation that really says, I love what turns you on, what you enjoy, but there are other things that I would like to include in our repertoire. It's about having a wide menu. So that's the conversation about, you know, um, fantasy at times feels like, you're not accepting the reality. That's what I'm hearing you say here. So, um, yeah, is there anything that I forgot? I don't think so. So I am going to say, ah, long distance relationship. Same thing as everything I said. Really, it's about not having calls where you catch up and you explain what you did the whole day because you just lived the day and now you have to tell the day. Skip it. Skip it. <coughs> On occasion, you know, text, a two-minute call, a voice message, an e a letter by hand, vary it, first of all. Don't sit in front of the camera. Do things and accompany each other to those things. I had a couple recently where one of them went to meet a couple of friends that the other person couldn't see. And basically, when they arrived to the other person's house, they turned on the thing and now everybody was there. Oh, man, I thought, what a good idea. One was stuck in another country, but she was actually with him. And another one was to hers. I mean, it, I've heard this now more, more often, where people literally basically went to visit people, you know, on Zoom while somebody else was there in reality. Fun, erotic, present, playful, engaged. I'm there too. I'm still in the game. That. That's what you want to do when it's long distance. It's not every day because it's exhausting. 
But a small thing goes a long way. That's really what I'm trying to say on the erotic front. It's not like you have to do this. It's not work. It's creativity. And when you are creative, you don't feel the work. That's the difference. All right. That's it. I'll see you soon. Letters from Esther Perel. Join me on YouTube. Sign up. And let's continue the conversation about our relationships, our confidence in them, and our pleasure in them. Goodbye.